solstice to you as well. From here until the end of the calendar year, the nights will continue to grow longer, the sun determined to rise later and set sooner, as we bleed out daylight hours, two minutes each day. Ooh, and I don't have to tell you what those looming shadows bring, what lurks in the forest just after the sun retires behind the ridge. What prowls just beyond the street lights glow, and what haunts the darkened halls that surround you. So enjoy that radiant glow while it lasts, absorb her energy, but be mindful of the ever coming shadows. Just ask Edel in the state of New York. Hey Derek, this is Edel calling you from Land Lakes, Florida, and I'm a longtime listener. This is my first time calling in. I was inspired to call in and share my story from a, uh, a previous episode that I had heard from a listener by the name of Virgil. It was a season 11, episode 12, where he talked about his experience with a glimmer man back in the 60s. Well, this is my experience or two experiences with a glimmer man and another odd incident that I uh, experienced back either in 1975 or 1976 when I was around six or seven years old. I'm, I'm 52 right now. Anyway, here we go. Oh, and this took place not in Florida. This actually took place in New York, the Bronx specifically. So at the time, um, I was uh, my family lived in a uh, like an 18-story building in the Bronx. It's basically like a project building, um, and we were living in the sixth floor at the time. And there, I, I was living with my mom, my dad, and um, my much older brother. He was probably like in his 20s at the time. Anyhow, it was around eight or 8:30 in the evening. And I remember that my dad had left for work. He worked evenings at the post office, graveyard shift. So um, at the time in the apartment, it was just me and my mom, actually. Now, I remember it was around 8 or 8.30 because I distinctly remember watching on TV an old sitcom that was called Chico and the Man. And I know that came on around prime time back in the day. So anyhow, it was just me and my mom. My mom is in the bathroom taking a shower. So I'm the only one in the apartment, in the living room. I'm actually eating like a TV dinner. I remember those. Anyhow, so I'm there watching the TV. And then all of a sudden, I start hearing a high-pitched ringing sound in my ear. And out of the corner of my eye, down the hallway, near the bathroom door... I see what basically all I can say are two figures slowly materializing and they seem to be kind of almost made out of tinsel and just like back in season 11 episode 12 how Virgil described that uh, they kind of look like they were being beamed down like in Star Trek so these things seem to be just like made out of glitter and that's what it was it was two beings i guess approximately six seven feet tall 
my brother, he was 6'2", and I could definitely tell that they were taller than my brother. And the also weird thing was that they seemed to be 2D. Like, they, you could see the, the width and uh, the height, but it, it just seemed to be, like, paper thin. So they seemed to be, like, 2D. Now, I saw them materialize in the hallway, and they're there. Now, thinking back, you would think this has had to be the most terrifying experience, especially for a kid of six or seven. But for some reason, I wasn't scared. I was actually angry. And in the back of my mind, how I thought of it was like, you're not supposed to be here. You can't be here. And I just felt very protective of my mom. It's like, you know, my mom's in the bathroom taking a shower. She doesn't know what's going on. These things are close to the bathroom. Something's going to happen to my mom. Whatever these beings were, I got a sense that they were surprised that I could see them. And I still don't even know what I was thinking. I was just went into full protection mode, knowing that my mom was in the bathroom taking a shower, unaware of any of this stuff that was going on. So I got up from the table where I was eating my TV dinner and I ran into the hallway. And I just remember going into the middle of these two entities and just swinging, punching through them. And it was as if I'm punching through air. And all I remember is that they, I, I was like punching through this glitter, it, it sparkly air, but I wasn't connecting with anything. It's like my, my arms and my punches, my fists were going through them. And they just within like a few seconds disappeared i remember just standing in the hallway and i could hear my mom in the shower and whatnot and i in my mind was just like i'm not going to tell my mom what's going on (laughs) that she wouldn't be able to handle this and it was just like i'm going to not mention anything because in my head it was sort of like She's not going to understand this. She's going to freak out. I'm just going to keep it to myself. So I just went back to the table and I just was watching TV. Now, fast forward a couple of weeks later, I'm in the same bathroom and I'm going to use the bathroom. And I'm about to, you know, use the toilet. And I wanted to close the door behind me and... As I'm closing the bathroom door, I see what I can best describe as a floating entity, golf ball size, kind of burnt orange, and the best way I can describe it was it looked like a puffer fish, and it seemed to be coming around the corner of the door, and it just looked at me, I looked at him, and I remember that completely freaked me out, scared me. And I ran out of the bathroom, down the hall, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs for my mom. Again, this happens in the evening. My father's not home. My brother's not home. And my mom just like going, what happened? What happened? And I'm just trying to explain to her that something, I saw a monster. I saw something floating in the bathroom. And of course, she didn't believe me and she calmed me down and and that incident came and went. Now, fast forward a couple of months later, and this must have been in the fall, like that first incident with the Glimmerman entities happened probably in the summer. Fast forward a few months later in the fall, I remember being asleep at that. There was two bedrooms in the apartment. One for my brother, and then one that I share with my parents. My father was at work. It's just me and my mom and my brother. He's sleeping in his room. I'm sleeping in the other bedroom with my bed that I shared with my parents. They had their bed. I don't even know what time it was, but it was probably around 11, 12. I remember waking up to that same high-pitched ringing in my ears, and I knew it was these glimmer things. I remember getting out of the bed, opening up the bedroom door, 
walking down the hallway and going into the kitchen. And my mom is asleep. She's not moving. She doesn't hear anything. Anyway, I remember tiptoeing into the kitchen and seeing one of these Glimmerman entities. Again, same thing. 2D, tall, six foot plus, looking like how the spark, again, Star Trek kind of glittery figure. And again, I got the feeling that it was surprised that I could see it. I remember it standing there, getting the feeling that it was surprised that I could see it, and then it fading away. Again, I went into like full protection mode on my mom, and I was like, in my mind, even though I didn't say it out loud, I kept saying it in my head, you, you, you shouldn't be here. Why are you here? Don't be here. And as it faded away, all I remember was tiptoeing back into the bedroom that I shared with my mom and just going back into my bed and falling asleep. Yeah, so that's my, that's my experience with Glimmerman uh, back in, again, it must have been either 75 or 76. Uh, yeah, there you go. Anyway, keep up the good work. Hopefully uh, you can use this. Take care. Thanks, Edel. Well, there's two things you don't hear every day. A Glimmerman sighting and a Glimmerman sighting in the city of all places. Now, if you're a long-time listener to the program, you already know of some of the past Glimmerman experiences we've shared here on the show. An overwhelming majority of those taking place in the outdoors, if not in vast wilderness areas. But Edel's call is a bit different. But before we venture down that path any further, for those that aren't long-time listeners, perhaps the Glimmer Man is a foreign concept. Well, if you would, please allow Steve Stockton of 13 Past Midnight to introduce you to this enigmatic entity. Now, in recent years, there's been a large number of eyewitness accounts claiming to have encountered these beings. Some might say, if these beings are invisible, how can anyone see them? Well, these beings are not entirely invisible. They're actually cloaked, like the alien being in the movie The Predator. They look like translucent beings. The only noticeable thing is the outline of the being, which reveals its humanoid shape, while the background is visible through the being, but distorted. Descriptions of this distortion vary according to the terminology used by the witness. Heat waves, transparent plastic wrap, a shimmer. Now while we don't know who or what these beings are, they seem to hang out in the woods, although there are few reports of such a being inside one's own home or even in the city. Well, also thanks to his channel, here is another inner city glimmer man experience. Feel free to contrast and compare. I had an encounter with something like this myself once. And oddly enough, it wasn't in the woods, but rather while waiting for a late night commuter train in downtown Portland, Oregon. I was on my way home to enter southeast Portland from downtown after having attended an event at Powell's City of Books. It was late, getting close to midnight if I recall correctly, and I was waiting for the orange line of Portland's max commuter train service. I'd grown tired of sitting and was instead pacing up and down the block by the train stop, peering into all the darkened shop windows. Something odd caught my eye. At the corner, between a signpost and a city trash can, I noticed what I could only describe as a strange shimmering in the air. It was roughly the size and shape of a smallish human figure, and while see-through, the shape itself looked sort of like the wavy lines of heat one can see coming from pavement in hot weather. Taken aback and rather startled, I watched the shimmering figure from about five, six yards away. Suddenly, as if it had noticed that I was observing it, the figure seemed to crouch down, and then other than the shimmering, remained motionless. At this point, I became hyper aware that something unexplained was happening. I felt the hair on my neck and arms stand up. 
I sensed an immediate need to leave the area, sort of a fight or flight syndrome, but felt that if I fled too quickly, the entity might give chase. With as much reserve as I could muster, I dawdled around a bit, feigned impatience, and then slowly began to amble away. I had to pass directly in front of the area where whatever it was had crouched, but at least had the trash can between it and myself. As I stood on the corner, waiting for the crossing light to change, I suddenly and very intentionally bolted out into the street against the light and directly into the path of an oncoming car. The driver had to hit the brakes, and this gave me the desired result. I broke into a run as if getting out of the car's way, and continued at a brisk pace on up the street several blocks to the next train stop. Now, for those of you in the know, I'm sure this story had a bit of creep factor to it. After all, it is further evidence that this phenomena can be experienced anywhere, and that seems to be just the case. Reports have originated from several different decades, most states in the U.S. and several different countries. What I'm getting at is... This is not strictly a North American phenomena. And if you are new, you probably picked up on this creature's similarity to the character The Predator from the 1987 film of the same name. And you might be thinking these witnesses were probably influenced by that film franchise itself. Well, what if I told you that the creator of the creature's trademark camouflage effect was Joel Hynek, none other than son of Mr. Blue Book himself, astronomer, professor, and ufologist J. Allen Hynek. Leaving some to suggest that the concept for this otherworldly look just might have been extraterrestrial in nature. Alluding to the idea that Joel heard about this effect from his father through one of his cases. So if you're interested in all this, check out Steve Stockton's video. I've posted a link in the show notes. He seems to cover a lot of these Glimmerman encounters, as does Lon Strickler of Phantoms and Monsters, and those boys down at Expanded Perspectives podcast. So go, look them up, and absorb all that info, if you're intrigued. And thanks Adele, for sharing that harrowing account. Now up next, we venture to the OK state of Oklahoma. Please, welcome Eric to the program. Hey Derek, this is Eric from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I've been listening to your show for about two or three years. Uh, This is my first time calling, so I'm really excited to potentially contribute to the show in some way. My story takes place about eight years ago. My friend and I were sharing an apartment And we had kind of been going through a stretch of just not really fighting, but there was some negative energy between us for a while, at least at the time that this incident happened. One night I go to bed. It's around 2 a.m. that I go to bed. And this is significant because my sleep schedule was so off at the time. I probably had been going to bed around like 5 or 6 a.m., for you know, several months at that time. But for whatever reason, I decided to go to bed around one or two. So three hours earlier, I am jarred awake from this just stupid dream. <laughs> it wasn't spooky. It wasn't scary. It was just a really silly, ridiculous dream. I won't go into details about it. But I'm jarred awake and I'm frozen on my bed. I'm looking straight above me uh, at the ceiling. And there is a figure uh, standing above me, not really a monstrous figure, totally a humanoid, this big, burly male figure in jean coveralls, almost as if it's like, you know, a prison uniform or something like that. He's lunging out at me, not so much like the physical action of lunging, but like he's frozen in the position of lunging at me. And the creepiest detail about the visage of this uh, figure was that he didn't have a head. He was headless. A headless, big, burly man was standing above me, reaching out for me. And I felt the oddest feeling that I still haven't felt to this day, again, 
of total like paralyzing fear and dread coupled with this totally serene tranquility of knowing that I was going to be okay, knowing that I probably wasn't going to die from whatever this thing was. And so there was this weird kind of like juxtaposition of emotional state that I experienced during this scenario. And the next day I tell my friend and his eyes just kind of go wide, his jaw goes slack. And he's like, just three days ago, I had an experience with a shadow person in my room where I woke up in a paralyzed state and I saw a shadow figure in the corner of my room. And we just were both just kind of like in awe at that. We had this like collective gasp. So obviously, like the kind of collective explanation for what happened is sleep paralysis. And, you know, it probably was sleep paralysis for both of us. But what's interesting to me about the scenario was that we both had this experience while we were kind of like going through a fight together. And so it made me think, you know, what if like negative energies can conjure up and can manifest like sightings of stuff like this. And uh, maybe there was like negative energy left over from like a previous tenant, like a haunting or something. But I just remember how terrified I was whenever I saw this thing. And I didn't sleep for like 48 hours after that. Uh, thanks again for accepting my call. I hope to hear my story on your show someday and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Okay. I agree. This sounds like sleep paralysis. All the clues are present. Waking up paralyzed. Fear. Anxiety. Visual hallucinations. But I think I'm with Eric here. It is a little strange that both roommates experienced these terrifying episodes within a similar time period. Although I will admit that that coincidence may have seemed more significant if the two men saw the same figure during their collective experiences. So what do you think? Sleep paralysis or something more? Thank you again, Eric, for calling in. Now, if you have a true paranormal story you would like to share here on the show, call our hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or if you're outside the country, record your story as a voice memo and email it to me at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. Now then, this next one takes us back to the Sunshine State, where MJ had an experience she can't explain. Hey, my name is MJ. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. I'm calling because I heard a story from Kristen. It was on season 11, episode 18. I always tell this story, but I never heard any experience like it on the podcast. So this kind of made me want to tell my story of a floating red orb. I'm going to say this was probably back in 2016 because my daughter was, oh, actually, no, 2017 because she was still kind of of a baby. She was born in November 2016. So we were living in an apartment in Coral Gables, and it was just uh, me, my husband, and obviously my baby daughter. It was one night. Um, We went to sleep like normal, you know, turned off the lights, closed the door, make sure everything's okay. My daughter has already been sleeping and we went to sleep. I didn't think anything of it. Nothing was different. And same with my husband. Um, And then whatever, I wake up the next morning and my husband's like, oh, I have to tell you something that happened last night. I'm like, what do you mean something happened last night? And he goes, well, uh, for some reason, I just woke up from like a a sleep, a deep sleep. And I... uh, see a red orb he's like it's just like a ball of light like how Kristen explained it well like her mom it's just a a ball and he said that it was floating from our living room into our bedroom over our daughter's crib and then it kind of just went into the closet. We had a walk-in closet that went from the closet into 
the bathroom, if that makes sense. So it's like a hallway, and the end of the little hallway is going to be the bathroom. And then there's no exit from there. It's just the bathroom. So if you want to leave, it would have to be coming from the other way. And then, mind you, we kind of lived in a way like in a dead end street. So there's no like traffic or anything like that. But yeah, that's how he explained it to me. It's just a ball, a red orb, and it was floating and it was kind of like moving up and down and it was slow. But yeah, that was what happened to him. And then it, the weird thing is, I think two nights after he was sleeping and um, he ended up hearing a woman's voice whispering in his ear and they would say, he's in the corner, he's in the corner. He didn't open his eyes or anything just because he was kind of frightened to. And then the next morning he asked me if I said anything, like he's in the corner. I'm like, why would I even say that? It doesn't make any sense. But he was just trying to make sure that it wasn't me. And then that same apartment, everything kind of happened in that same apartment. My daughter was sleeping and me and my husband were in the living room and we hear furniture moving upstairs. So just, we lived in a two story like complex, I guess you can say like apartment complex. So it's like us downstairs and then there's somebody living above us. So I remember hearing furniture moving and I remember seeing a, a few days ago, maybe a week ago, that somebody was moving out, so maybe it was them. But mind you, it was already like two o'clock in the morning. It was really late to be moving furniture and my daughter's asleep. So I got a little upset and I told them, listen, can you go upstairs and tell them, you know, if they can move furniture and stuff around later, like, you know, or in the morning or in the afternoon, just not at this time because it's been happening a lot. My husband was like, yeah, he was a little fed up himself. I we had a window that faced kind of like the staircase, so I can see him going upstairs to the second floor above us. So as I waited, I see him coming downstairs after a while. He had a super serious face. He kind of looked pale, and he comes in, opens the door, closes the door right like behind him quickly, locks the door, and he looks at me, and I'm like, okay, what happened? <laughs> Why do you look that way? You look kind of startled. And then he's like, well. You know how we have a window that faces into the living room from the hallway, which is like a little one. He's like, uh, there was no light coming through there, so I kind of just peeked in before I knocked on the door to see if like they were asleep or they stopped moving around furniture. And I see that there's no one living there. It's vacant, no furniture, no nothing. So yeah, I mean, I guess those are my three little stories. Man, that's where the call ended. But thank you, MJ. Now, as wild as that orb story is, I can't help but think the creepiest part for me is realizing that the apartment above them was empty. I can only imagine how the life drained from the husband's face as he realized the noises he'd been hearing have been coming from an abandoned apartment. I mean, it sounds like something out of a classic campfire story. And I love it. Thank you, MJ for taking the time to share that entry. Our friends at Manscaped would like to introduce you to their best and biggest ultimate hygiene bundle yet, the Platinum Package 4.0. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them with the whole shebang. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by heading to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code MONSTERS. Now you already know I've been a huge fan of Manscaped products for years now. And this time they've really hooked it up with the Platinum Package 4.0. It's the biggest bundle they've ever offered and gives you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. This bundle includes the Lawn Mower 4.0 Body Trimmer and the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. Both have that awesome Manscaped skin safe technology for protection against necks and ingrown hairs. Also included is the Ultra Premium Body Wash and the Ultra Premium 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner. And I can tell you how good each of these products smell. Now there's also the Ultra Premium Deodorant, which is aluminum-free and keeps me feeling fresh. And lastly, there's the Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Spray Toner. Lifesavers in those hot summer months. Now, Manscaped even threw in a couple free gifts, their super soft boxers, and the shed travel bag to hold your haul. Now, clearly, the Platinum Package covers all bases from head to toe and makes an awesome gift as well. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code MONSTERS at manscaped.com. 
That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code MONSTERS. It's time you enjoyed the finer things in life. Get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. And as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening, and back to that thing that keeps opening your cupboards. Okay, so this following one is unsettling. So please, welcome our anonymous caller from the state of Illinois. Good afternoon, Derek. I'm going to stay anonymous for this one due to the fact that there's some uh, pretty gruesome things that went on. So I'm from the northern Illinois area, and I was friends with this guy for a long time. We both lived together at one point and grew up together and all that stuff. And he was a pretty good guy and got along fairly well, you know. Never got into any legal issues or anything of that matter. We lost touch for a little while, you know, and once we grew up and got out of high school, you know, we didn't really talk to each other much after that, and years went by, and he moved away to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and after that, we kind of just lost touch. I've, I've heard that you've had a few uh, dream stories, and that's basically what this is, and so I don't know how this happened or, like, how I even had this dream, but... So I had a dream one night, it was uh, in January of 2019, and it was a night that it was winter time up here, and it was really cold, I believe it was one of the coldest temperatures in the uh, northern Illinois, with southern Wisconsin area in 2019, and the dream I had that night is very, very odd. I was in a cave, it was dark, it was candle lit, and... What happened was I'm walking through this cave and you can just feel the dampness in the air and it's really creepy and kind of reminded me of the Jeepers Creepers cave. I believe it was the first Jeepers Creepers movie and that guy actually went down the sewer pipe and he was in that cave. It, it kind of it reminded me of that and the really freaky part is my buddy that I used to be friends with, you know, his name's Kenny he was crawling on the ceiling and he was completely naked and I could see him talking but I couldn't I couldn't make out what he was saying I couldn't hear it I, I could see his lips moving you know and it, I believe in one of the exorcism movies a uh, old lady was crawling on the ceiling that's what it reminded me of so yeah that was a pretty scary dream but the really scary part is what happened the next morning I wake up the next morning and I start working. I was working from home at that time because they didn't want people driving in in the cold because it's negative 50 something degrees below zero. And so I wake up the next morning and my buddy Kenny's on the news. And he ended up killing some lady in a parking garage and hiding her under a car. I have no idea how the hell I had that dream to this day. It gives me goosebumps up my spine. How did, I, how did I have that dream? How did I dream that? That he was in the cave. He was crawling on the ceiling. He was evil. How did I dream that? It, it makes no sense to me. And, and for that to come up on the news the next morning, that it chills me to the bone to this day just thinking about it. Thanks for your show, Derek. I've been listening to it for a couple years now, and I, I love the show, and that's my story. Thanks, bud. Have a good one. Wow. Thank you, caller. A wild coincidence. Or did some sort of psychic connection cause our caller to pick up on the traumatic activities? You know, the story reminds me of a crazy story I first heard when I was about 11 years old. It begins with the death of 18-year-old Caitlin Arquette. She was shot in her car in July of 1989 near her home in the town of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Police on the case were struggling for answers. Psychics were brought in by Caitlin's mother in hopes that they could help. And that's where something strange occurred. Caitlin's mother, author Lois Duncan, known for writing books such as I Know What You Did Last Summer and Killing Mr. Griffin, began to see similarities in her own writings 
to the events surrounding her daughter's death. Strange coincidences that are maybe too on the nose to be simply that. Here is Lois in her own words, describing the messages that she seemed to receive from her deceased daughter via the old television series. Sightings. I didn't put any connection together in the beginning at all. It wasn't until one thing after another began to occur that I suddenly realized that I had more or less written the story of our own true life horror story. In Don't Look Behind You, I based the personality of my heroine April upon Kate. April was chased by a hitman in a Camaro. That book was published in June 1989, and in July 1989, Kate was chased down and shot to death by a trigger man in a Camaro. The most shocking thing of all to us was that when we read in the police file the Hispanic man who was arrested, his name was Mike, everybody called him Vamp, and in Don't Look Behind You, the hitman who chased down April was named Mike Vamp. Now here's the deal. This next little bit will be much more interesting if you've seen the entire sighting segment. Now luckily for you, it's free on YouTube. And the link is in the show notes. But for those of you that won't look it up, Duncan ended up hiring two psychics. And one provided a sketch of the killer that she claims came to her psychically. It just so happens to be a similar looking man to a character on one of Duncan's book jackets. The other psychic claimed Caitlin was involved with some shady characters. She hypothesized it was possible that Caitlin was associated with a local gang through her boyfriend. And when she was out the night she was murdered, she ended up seeing someone or something that she shouldn't have and was murdered as a result. Now that's haunting information, especially for Caitlin's mother. Because the case went even more cold after that, and Duncan died without ever knowing who killed her daughter, passing away in 2016. But time is a funny thing. It exposes everything. Even the truth. Albuquerque police believe this man, Paul Apodaca, shot and killed Caitlin Arquette while she was driving home from a friend's house in July 1989. Her car slammed into a light pole. Investigators say Paul Apodaca was at the crime scene. Last summer, they say Apodaca not only confessed to killing Caitlin, but two other young women, UNM student Althea Oakley and 13-year-old Stella Gonzalez in 1988. Investigators say Apodaca did not know his victims, that he had information only the killer would know. This week, he was indicted for Caitlin's death. Today, APD released this statement from the police chief saying, It is gratifying to see charges have finally been brought for the 1989 murder of Caitlin Arquette. While Paul Apodaca confessed to the killing, this case required a comprehensive review as a result of the publicity that has surrounded this case for three decades. Now, that clip was courtesy of KOAT Action News 7 out of Albuquerque. Paul Raymond Apodaca was charged for the crime and is currently awaiting trial. A serial killer that had no connection to Caitlin, nor her boyfriend's gang. His name wasn't Mike or Vamp, and there was no mention of a Camaro or a hitman. But most importantly, if Apodaca is to be believed, it was a random act of violence and not a planned murder. So it seems that none of the psychic's visions were accurate. But what about that police sketch of the killer, you might be wondering? Well, I've actually included in the show notes several different mug shots of Apodaca, including from when he was younger, as well as the face on the dust jacket, and the psychic's police drawing. So go to the show notes, take a look, and decide for yourself. Is that the same man? Now, as someone that's known about this case for a good long time, it's great to see it might have some closure, and I will keep you posted as the court case progresses. But also, as someone that's been following this case for a while, it's disappointing to see that all those predictions were so far off. But you know, as for our caller, it sounds like his premonition was dead on. So thank you again, caller, for sharing that entry. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to take a deep dive. 
Now coming up is a tale of caution and warning, straight out of Pennsylvania. Chase, welcome to the program. Hi, it's uh, Chase calling from central Pennsylvania. I just wanted to share an experience I had with a group of my friends when we were in high school. I've been binge watching a bunch of your sh- episodes and stuff, and it keeps me going at work. It's really awesome work, man. But I just wanted to say about a possible, like, demonic following. It's kind of crazy, and I didn't want to talk about it because it really, really does scare me. But we went to a cemetery. There were a bunch of them out there, and uh, we all went there doing what high school kids do. You know, I don't know why a cemetery thought was a great idea, but at that time it was something to do. And they all went out there, and, you know, maybe they were under the influence of uh, marijuana at the time. Unsure or not, but they were all out there. And one of the kids decided to pee on a gravestone. As we all know, that's not the right thing to do. And I was unaware of the situation at the time, but because there was a group of us. But we all were just messing around out there. He did that, and uh, we decided that we were going to head home because we are all going to hang out at each other's houses. So we were driving home, and the kid who peed on the gravestone was sitting in the passenger seat. And as we were driving back, as crazy as it sounds, we were on a road, no cars passed us, we weren't behind a truck or anything like that, nothing. Driving down the road, and we're just talking, listening to music, and all of a sudden, his passenger window shatters out of the car. <laughs> I don't know what could have caused it, not saying, like, a stone didn't fly up from possible tires. It was in a car, so it's not like the, it was a, the truck tires, like, poke out the side or anything. You know, it was a regular car with the wheels under the car, not out wide, and it... It, dude, it smashed the window out, and I don't know if that was a weird coincidence or not, but something definitely went on there. He didn't mention anything about what he had done, and we didn't know about it. And it was kind of, you know, it was like, oh, that's weird, you know, that's, that's kind of crazy. He didn't mention anything that that even happened, that he peed on the gravestone. Nobody knew this. And then we were all, like, chilling at the house and stuff, and a couple of us went to bed, and, you know, we lay on couches and whatever. We all end up just falling asleep. He, he uh, wakes up in like a rush and he's like, dude, why'd you hit me? And I'm like, I look at him. And I said, I didn't hit you. I was like, why would, why would I hit you? And he's like, dude, something hit me. He's like, I, I, I didn't hit you, man. And then he's like freaking out. I'm like, dude, look at your chest. And he looked at his chest and I, I crap you not, dude. There was a, like a perfect handprint with the fingers that were about, hell, like 10 inches long, eight inches long across his chest a perfect handprint eight inches long across his chest and we're like dude what is this and he ended up telling us and we're all like oh my god dude like this is something that you need to get go through like this needs to be fixed we were all freaked out that night we ended up actually going home and sleeping our own we didn't feel comfortable around him he ended up actually going to see someone and i guess it was like a medium or something where he had to be cleansed and they told him that there was two demons after him and they said the names of demons but i can't remember and I haven't talked to him lately because of work being split up. But as far as I know, nothing kept on happening. I was just curious if anybody had any experiences like that from, like, turning up something, from doing something disrespectful like that. I just wanted to hear your input. And, um, thank you for hearing me out. I hope this don't happen to anyone. And it's definitely scary and real. Thanks, man. Thanks, Chase. Let that be a lesson to all of you. One day you too will be gone. And I have no doubt you would want the same respect from future generations. So maybe I'm a little pleased that your punk friend got his comeuppance, Chase. I bet he won't be doing that again. But thank you for telling us about it. Listen, the world can be an extremely stressful place, and the unease and pressure many of us feel as a result can manifest in all sorts of nasty ways. Well, one way to combat these stressors is through microdosing. And that goes double for folks that struggle with anxiety or insomnia, just like I do. Now, if you poke around online, you'll find all sorts of people are microdosing to manage pain, get more sleep, lower anxiety, and overall improve their moods. Now, before you let those three little letters scare you, let me just say, microdose gummies by tonight's sponsor, Lumi Labs, are completely legal everywhere in the United States. And while these gummies contain cannabinoids, they're not designed to get you quote-unquote high in that stereotypical sense. Instead, I'm talking about entry-level small doses of THC and CBD that can help you wind down, chill out, and sleep like a baby. 
Now I know they've already helped so many people, so why don't you give them a try? Oh, and they taste delicious, and they make you feel great. Now, Microdose is available nationwide. And to learn more about microdosing THC, just do a quick search online or go to microdose.com and use code MONSTERSAMONGUS to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show notes, but again, that's microdose.com and code MONSTERSAMONGUS. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening. And back to that thing in the backyard. Now, before we get this last call, don't forget that we're currently running the Dogman Days of Summer sale over at our merchandise shop. That's 20% off everything in the Monsters Among Us store. So visit us at monstersamonguspodcast.com forward slash shop or just click that shop tab. Now then, that brings us to tonight's final entry. And this one takes us on a tour of UFO sightings throughout the world. The following is Julie's entry from Germany. Hi, Derek. My name is Julie. Uh, I'm calling because, (laughs) of course, your, your show really inspired me to call and share my own stories. And I must say I love the show. So my story is about the times that I believe I have seen a UFO. This is such a mysterious part of my life that I never found an explanation for that I'm hoping maybe somebody in the show could shine a light on what it could be. And uh, I'll start with my first encounter. I was something about five years old or six in the house I grew up in in Brazil, in the southern part of Brazil. And my father and I, we were closing the gate of our house. It was sunset in a hot day. So I believe it was probably around 6 p.m. And then I started looking at the sky and there is this... It was as big as the moon. Looking from where we were, it was as big as the moon. And it was a circle in the sky. It seemed like a floating sphere. And it kept coming closer and closer and I noticed that my father was also looking at it. But the, the f- weird thing about it is that the feeling I have from, from this experience is that we were suspensed in time. Like time simply froze. I didn't focus on anything else or looked at anything else. I don't remember any sound, anything. I just remember looking at this fear floating in the sky. And what makes the story weirder and the reason why I could never explain what it could be is that it seemed to be made of metal like brushed metal but it was yellow (laughs) and I have researched a lot about UFOs it's a obsession that I have since I was very young and I never found anybody saying the same thing saying that they have seen a yellow sphere floating in the sky And uh, my father remembers this very well. And uh, I remember that when I realized that it was a UFO, because since, as I said, since I was very small, I was obsessed with it. I looked at my father and I was like, let's run inside. I was taken by a, a fear, absurd fear. And I ran inside the house. And uh, at this point, the UFO thing was floating on top of the roof of her house. So... I ran to the other side of the house to take another look at it before it went away and it had disappeared. But it went over our house, I ran inside to take a good look at it on the other side of the house and I didn't see anything anymore. So my father also said that he has never seen anything like that, he doesn't know what it was and he remembers it very well. And he told me also that once when he was painting a wall I think I don't know with a friend of him of his in the same house he saw a tube of light coming over the house from the side and also disappearing not coming to the other side of the house so my obsession as a kid was trying to figure out what was up with our house and there was one specific point of our house that the compass didn't show any direction so my theory is that my house was some type of portal or something on top of it but well it's just 
just to make fun but uh the thing is we really saw it and it was something very incredible i know that some memories degrade with time the way we remember them but i have checked with my father many times what have you seen that day what have you seen that day and he has also seen the same thing a yellow metal brushed sphere floating in the sky then i haven't seen anything else strange until last year And I decided to make this call because I listened to some episodes talking about moving stars. And last year, now it's again festival seasons here in Germany. And last year uh, I attended a festival about one hour away from Berlin. And in these festivals it's pitch black. It's very dark between the, the dance floors and the camping area. So you can see the sky very clearly. And... I remember I was walking and I was looking up. My husband was with me as well. And we were looking at the star and he said, oh, look, it's a satellite. And I was looking up at it and indeed the star was moving. And then we continued walking and I was still staring at the sky, at this specific star, because there were two stars coming together in different directions. One was coming more horizontally and one was more coming down vertically in the sky i don't know how to explain it better than this but it seemed like they would meet at some point that's why i was looking because i thought it was two satellites going in different directions and then i looked up at it and one continued going the the horizontal one continued going and the one that was going vertically ooh, it just got shivers stopped and started going on the opposite direction and that's when i was like what the hell is that <laughs> because I know satellites don't do that. They're supposed to keep going on their orbit. But that star stopped and started going right on the opposite direction. My husband didn't see it happening, but I showed him that the star was going now on the opposite direction. And he didn't really care much about it. He was like, yeah, whatever. But I was very impressed. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking about. And in that same year, on a different festival... Something different happened. As I said, uh, it's very dark at night, so it's possible to see the sky very clearly. And we were walking towards the festival, and I looked up, and I noticed that my husband looked up at the same moment, like we were both looking at something in the sky, but nobody else seemed to be paying attention to it. And as weird as it sounds, it seemed to be a triangle of light in the sky, which I thought it could have been a drone because they're making videos of the festival for the after video. And uh, it didn't move. It was just there. And I thought it was a drone until I noticed how high it was. It was really, really high up over the clouds. And there was even some stars in front of it. So it was really, really, really high in the sky. And it was barely visible, but it was clearly a triangle. It seemed to be like tail lights, you know, when you break your car, the red lights that come up. It looked like that, like that shade of redness and brightness, but it wasn't that intense. It looked like it was a foggy night or something, and it was really high up in the sky and barely visible. And then I looked at my husband and said, do you see that? And he said, a red triangle in the sky. And I was like, yeah, what the f*** is that? <laughs> And yeah, we also couldn't find any other explanation to it apart that it was a very weird looking drone. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm sorry for the very long video. I hope that you can use it for the show. And uh, I would really appreciate if somebody could perhaps find an explanation for what it is. So that's it. Yeah, keep up the good show and have a great day. Thanks for calling in, Julie. Now, I don't know Julie's age, but she noted that her strange Brazilian UFO encounter occurred when she was around five or six. And if that puts us back in the mid-90s, Julie's sighting wouldn't be the only one to come out of southern Brazil around that time. In January of 1996, southern Brazil was abuzz with UFO sightings. Hundreds reported seeing strange, hovering objects that they couldn't explain. In the early hours of January the 20th, 1996, a number of UFOs were reported in the skies above central Brazil. Some of them were captured on a home video. 
Well, about 2 a.m. in the morning of the January 20th, some satellites from the United States detected an object entering Earth's atmosphere. Of course, it was aiming to Brazil, and they let us know, the American authorities, or American military, let Brazilian authorities know that it was aiming to Brazil, so we should keep a, an eye on it. Then, in a bizarre twist, reports started emerging that one of these UFOs had actually crashed near the town of Virginia. And this is why Virginia is known as Brazil's Roswell. Now, the home video mentioned in that Sci-Fi Channel documentary clip called The Virginia Incident can be found in the show notes. And I've also included additional video that is quite compelling, taken from that same area and time. It's especially compelling considering that it's some 26 years old. And as spooky as those videos are, they pale in comparison to what reportedly happened next. At this same morning, about 7.30, some people in the neighboring areas of Virginia started describing a strange creature. Obviously, the creature that survived from the crash. They said it was a terrible smell of ammonia, uh, burning the noses, they couldn't breathe, and it was a very ugly creature. So, like something out of a Spielberg movie, a creature, possibly more, loose in the streets. The town is frantic. Three girls happen to spot one of the creatures cowering by a wall. They said it was hairless, humanoid, small with red eyes and three horns or ridges on its head. The girls also noted that the creature seemed to be sweating heavily. One even likened her experience to seeing the devil himself. Then another invading force came to town. In January the 20th, the fire department captured a creature, a very strange creature, and it had three fingers with long and very strong nails. All of a sudden, Brazilian militaries were right in front of an alien being. They wrapped this creature in a net and put inside this uh, one by one uh, square meters wood box and gave it straight to the militaries who went there to pick it up. One of the creatures in the military facility scratched one of the tables, wood table. You should see what happened to the table when one of the creatures just scratched it. Now again, all three of these clips are courtesy of that Sci-Fi Channel documentary. And there's not much info out there on this case. So take a chance to hear something new. And while you're watching those clips, and you hear the creature's description, and you see the artist's take on the alien's appearance, think back to other cases we've discussed over the years. A shorter stature, hairless skin, horns or ridges on the head, sharp claws, and red eyes. Now maybe fans of Puerto Rico's Chupacabra might notice the similarities. Witnesses in Puerto Rico describe the chupacabra as a two-legged hairless beast that stands on its hind legs like a kangaroo with sharp fangs and huge glowing red eyes. It resembles a gargoyle. Now it's worth mentioning that the Virginia and chupacabra flaps took place less than one year apart. Oh, and of course, that clip comes courtesy of Monster Quest. So there you go, Julie. Maybe your sighting was part of a bigger flap, or perhaps even a crash on the scale of Roswell. But from the sounds of things, Julie, you're lucky that a glowing golden ball is all that you saw. Thanks again for calling in. Because that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Addie Lloyd. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And if you're poking around on the internet, please consider giving us a rate and review on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever that sort of thing is possible. A few kind words and five full stars go a long way to help the show out. And while you're at it, give us a like and follow over at YouTube. And finally, the music from tonight's episode 
and you can find that at co.ag music iron cthulhu apocalypse and carl casey at white bat audio thank you so much for listening and until next week In an attempt to outweird last week's entry, please welcome our anonymous caller from parts I know. Yes. Sometimes while I'm sleeping, I can see through my eyelids into the room I'm sleeping in, in perfect clarity. Don't know how this is possible, but I uh, never heard it before. I wanted to tell you first and see what the subscribers have to say. There's something that I just can't explain. And when I wake up, I feel like a different person. I guess that's the worst part of the mom. Because when I look through my eyelids when I'm sleeping, it's like, I guess, a different dimension or the same one in, in a different perspective. And I would like to really, really know if anyone else goes through these, how can I say, when you look through your own eyelids while you're sleeping and see the room that you're in in 3D. There's no shadow men. There's no distortion at all. Perfect clarity. I would really, really like to know if someone else experiences this. My God, I'm sounding so stupid right now. But yes, I know someone else does. It's just uh, something they haven't expressed yet. Just like me. I'm expressing to you for the first time in my whole life. All right, please. Throw this out there for me. And if someone else can relate to what I express to you, <sighs> I sleep a whole lot better. As a matter of fact, I know it's going to happen to me tonight. While I'm sleeping, I'm going to see through my eyelids to the room that I'm in. All right, Derek, thanks. I don't know a lot of things, but I think maybe this might be one of those useless superpowers. You know, like cheese manipulation, or the ability to turn invisible, but only when no one's looking. I actually have one of those superpowers myself. I can strangely guess what time it is, usually down to the minute when I wake up in the middle of the night. Which is useless, because who cares what time it is? It's the middle of the night. Anyway, so what do you say, good listeners? Can any of you shed some light on our caller's issue. If so, you know what to do. 1-888-608-NIGHT Thanks again, caller, for sharing. Now, if you would, kindly step inside the vehicle and fasten your safety belt. We're going down this road a stretch. Won't you join us beyond? The $5 level over at Patreon gets you access to the rest of this episode. And a hell of a lot more, if I might say so myself. So that's patreon.com forward slash Monsters Among Us podcast. Now crank down the window, feel the night air over your skin, and wave as Joel passes by en route to Texas. <laughs>